Okay, praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to class this morning. Uh, welcome to our um, online students. Thank you for joining class. And also like to welcome our e-learning students who will be listening to this uh, lecture later on. Um, we'll begin um, studying about um, the revivals, the visitation, and the moves of God, right? Okay. So uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Can I ask Bimal to lead us in prayer, please? Thank you, Jesus. We come under your name and we lift up your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you for today's morning. Thank you for today's class. Lord, help us to learn more and uh, help us to uh, uh, learn from your word, Lord Jesus. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Online students, you were able to hear Vimal when he prayed? Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, last class we began looking at what was revival, what it means, what does it mean by the visitation of God, and what do we mean by the move of God? Right? So what is revival? Okay, you can use the mic. Bringing some... Yeah. Bringing something back to life. Okay. Bringing something, um, uh, you know, something uh, to life that was dead. Okay. What do we mean by visitation? What do we mean by visitation? Online students can also unmute your mics and speak. We're just doing a recap of what we studied last uh, week. What is the meaning of visitation? Can you just give her the mic, please? We experience God's power in a special way. OK. Oh, visitation is when God's what? What of God? God's move. Sorry? God's move in our life. Okay. But what of God when you're talking about when we're saying visitation of God? Okay, more of God's presence. We're basically talking that, you know, when God comes in all of his power and glory. Okay. It's more than what we usually experience during our reg regular church gatherings or regular prayer meetings but it's something when god comes in much more power or comes in a much more powerful way what do we mean by the move of god when people are transformed okay when lives are transformed yes what else Okay, there's miracle signs, uh, wonders that happen. And what is the other important thing? Yes, spreading of the gospel. Okay, we carry his presence and we see that there is a mighty uh, move of God's presence in spreading the gospel to nations and to nations. Okay, um, basically there's more of missions, there's more of evangelization okay that happens during this time so it's not only that we experience the presence and the power of the whole of the holy spirit or the presence and power of god it impacts people so much it impacts life so much that it moves into the community and the society so it's not only the church that is meeting where revival is happening it's not only the house where revival is happening it's not only the hall where revival is happening that people coming there are impacted, but the revival move is also moving into our society, into our community. Okay, And it's impacting the lives of people. So how is the impact that happens? How is the impact that happens? With the impact that happens in the lives of people, how is it? What is the main feature of it? Okay, they repent. Hey guys, you are not listening so, to the lecture that happened last week. When they experience God, His presence when in their life. When they experience life. God, okay. 
What is a tra life transformation that happens? How is it? What is the characteristic of the life transformation? Christ likeness, okay. People turning away from their sins. Okay, people desiring for more of God. Intimacy with God. Intimacy with God, okay. It's not something that happens just momentary, right? It's a lifelong experience. It becomes a lifelong experience. It becomes a lifelong a lifestyle, a transformation that is impacting people for the rest of their lives. It's not something that is momentary, just emotions that flare up. But revival is something that happens and it impacts people for the rest of their lives. Okay. So when we're pursuing revival, what are we looking for? Or when we are praying for revival, what are we desiring? Intimacy, his presence. Intimacy of, of his presence, yes. More of his glory. Intimacy, oh, more of his glory, more of his revelation, more of his power. Are we just desiring to see more signs, miracles, and wonders? Is that what we are pursuing? No. Like um, uh, Lucy says, and uh, uh, like John Blessy says, presence of God. We are, we are pursuing more of the salvation of God, the Christ likeness, and more of the manifestation of God. So when we are thirsting and hungering for more of the presence of God, more of intimacy with God, then the other things that happen are a natural process. It means communities, societies are transformed, reach, you know, and uh, evangelization is happening, mission work is happening in a greater uh, magnitude, in a greater level than what we were doing as a church. And also that, you know, um, lives are uh, transformed and of course there is signs miracles and wonders okay so we basically looked at um, uh, chapter one till page number five um, sorry not page number five till page number three um, last class yes till page number three so now we are going to look at page number four in your in the textbook uh, which is revivals visitation of the moves of god we look at what happens in revival. Okay, what happens in a revival or what happens in a outpouring? So there are some general experiences that happens during revivals that is very, very characteristic. And it is something that we see in the revivals that have happened in the Bible. Especially when we're looking at revivals, which is the main revival we are looking at in the Bible. Any idea? When we are going to be studying revivals or the, you know, the, the coming revivals that God is going to bring, what is our, uh, you know, the main uh, prototype that we are going to be looking at? The book of Acts, okay. Sorry. Okay, where, what are we going to be looking at? What is our, what is the main prototype or what is the main revival that happens that we are going to look at all other revivals in the light of that revival that happened in the Bible? Huh? Second coming is still to come, no? <laughs> the revival that's already happened, which one? Which is the main revival that we will be looking at, which, and also looking at all other revivals that follow in pattern to what has happened in the Bible. In Acts, in the book of Acts, yes, but which... Uh, is it, is it the pen on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost. Yes, thank you, Warren. Thank you, Angeline. So it's the it's a Pentecost, right? The Pentecost is the revival that happened. And uh, that is our, going to be our main study, uh, main thing that we are going to keep as focus. And all other revivals that we will be looking at, we will see that it will come... It will match what happened in um, on the day of Pentecost. And also the coming revivals, the future revivals that we are going to see, all will be aligned to what happened on the day of Pentecost. Okay, So uh, what are some of the general experience that happens during revivals that we can say, hey, this is a revival? Sometimes what happens is, you know, crusades or some meetings that happen like for three days or four days, we think that is a revival meeting. But we need to know what really is, a, what happens really in a revival. What is the experiences that happen in a revival to say, hey, this is a revival. 
this is God bringing a revival in our midst. So some general experiences that have uh, that have happened, which we will look at. And so we can look at all other revivals in the light of this, and we will also know what we can anticipate or what we get, we will experience um, when we go through a revival. Yes, get rude. Yes, get rude. You had your hand up. You want to say something? Oh uh, no, that was by mistake, sister. Okay. So the first one is a great revelation of God. Okay. So a great revelation of who God is. It's being able to see God for who he is, seeing his power, seeing how awesome he is. You know, now all of these years of our life, yes, we have been able to see who God is. We've been able to experience him. We know how awesome he has been to us. You know, um, we've experienced his wonderful ways. But when God comes in a revival, it's like a whole new revelation of God's power and God's glory. Okay, it's in, in, in such a great magnitude that people, you know, just recognize their own sinfulness. They recognize their own weaknesses in contrast to God's holiness. Okay, so the revelation that happens during a revival is much greater than what happens usually when we meet on a Sunday service or we meet in a prayer group or fair, fair fellowship or, you know, crusade meetings. It is something that is on a whole new experience level where we experience God's power and glory in such a great magnitude that, you know, people begin to recognize their own sinfulness and their own weaknesses in, the, in contrast to God's holiness. Okay. An example we see is in Isaiah. Right, Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah sees this vision of God, right? When the glory of God fills the temple, when God fills his temple with all of his glory and his uh, holiness, what is Isaiah's uh, response to that? I'm a sinner, yes. What is uh, Isaiah's response when he sees God's glory and his uh, his uh, power just, you know, filling the temple? What does he say? Woe to me, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Okay, so we see that, you know, Isaiah, when he says, you know, oh to me, he's encountering God's glory, he's encountering God's holiness. And uh, that makes that holiness and that glory of God makes him realize his own unworthiness. So that is what revival does. So when revival happens, we encounter God's glory. You also recognize your unworthiness, your sinfulness in the light of God's glory. The second thing is, um, you know, there's a greater revelation of spiritual truth. Okay. We have, we receive a deeper understanding of things which we may already know. Okay. I'm not saying that, hey, there's new revelation. There are things that we already know, but there is a deeper understanding of the truth. There's a deeper understanding of the revelation of God. Okay. So we may know about God inviting us into the holy place, but understanding that in a much deeper way than what we have experienced before so everything will be on a greater level of experience than what we have experienced before greater power than what we have experienced before greater glory greater revelation greater spiritual truths than what we have understood uh, before because god will open us the spirit eyes of our spirit man in a very new fresh way so there's a greater understanding of his revelation a greater understanding of the truths okay the things that we have uh, already known uh, will become much clearer. Uh, and then as we are reading God's word, there will be more revelation in those times. There will also be a greater desire that is stirred up in our hearts just to read God's word, just to meditate on God's word, a greater desire to know God's truth. That's why people will come from all over. People will just spend hours together just reading the Bible, just uh, with intimacy with God, just speaking to God, just uh, receiving from God. And this is another characteristic of um, a revelation where people will start, 
you know, pursuing a greater knowledge of God through his word. There's a greater hunger for God that is stirred up, a greater pursuing of a greater knowledge of the revelation of God that will be stirred up in us. Okay. The third thing, another, uh, uh, you know, experience that we will experience when we go through revival is uh, uh, an increased passion for spiritual things. Okay. So there'll be an increased passion for, uh, or an increased desire to spend time. What are the spiritual things? Prayer, worship, what else? Fasting, yes. A greater desire just to be in the presence of God, just soaking in his uh, presence. Okay. Now, for example, the, the last revival we saw, I think, happened in Asbury, right, in the U.S. Asbury, it happened in February uh, 2023. Uh, it was the Asbury Seminary. And, uh, you know, people just pers pursuing God and say such a great level that even the classes were shut down. They stopped the classes, okay, because people wanted to pursue the presence of God in a greater way. And, and during this time of revival, you know, there's a greater hunger, there's a greater desire for more of God, for more of the things of God. And people make sacrifices, people, sacrifices like this, you know, they gave up their uh, classes, people give up their jobs, their people, uh, you know, um, give up even their um, hard-earned savings that they have kept to travel from different parts of the world to come to this place where revival is happening, to spend money and just staying in hotels, you know, and just pursuing the presence of God. That is such a greater hunger. So you see even the Asbury um, revival that happened in Feb 2023, you know, people were just sitting out um, the whole day, people were sleeping in their cars, you know, people with, uh, had moved into homes close by, people had moved into, um, you know, hotels and all of that just to pursue. They were so hungry for God. There's a greater hunger, there's a greater stirring for a hunger and the presence of um, God. So people make uh, great sacrifices, you know, so we see all of this and people are just praying, fasting, just worshipping and gathering together with believers. The fourth thing is there's an increased desire to witness. Okay, we've already spoken about all of these things. Just reiterating, how do we know that what is happening is a revival? How can we call that as really as a revival, as a visitation, as a move of God? So the fourth thing is that there should be an increased desire for witness. So even as people experience God, there's a great desire to share it with others. Okay, so... You know, even if it's not posted on social media, people go and spread the word around. Uh, people go back to their nations. People from their nations come, from their communities come, from their churches come. And so there is a leading for people to witness more. So there's more of mission work happening, more of evangelism happening. Yes, normally when events happen in our church, we all focus on missions. We all focus on um, evangelizing. And when we have uh, different minister, you know, programs in our church, we know what happens, right? At APC, we announce it uh, three or four months in advance, and then uh, closer to the day, we, you know, keep announcing it. We send WhatsApp messages, you know, we have uh, announcement for the churches. People call up and say, "Please attend, please attend." So there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, reminders, a lot of messages that are sent to encourage people to attend. That usually happens when we have church events. But when revival happens, even if there is, <coughs> sorry, even if people don't go and share it with others or put it in social media posts, or even if people are not saying it, or when there's very less publicity, even if it's on social media posts, people just come to know about it and they're drawn to see what God is doing. They just want to experience God. They just want to experience the move of God. Okay. So many of the revivals that happen <clears throat> in the past, you 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 went you studied many of them, you learned many of them during your um, um, uh, orientation week, right? It happened in the 1950s, 1930s, 1940s, and that time social media was not very very great. Okay, we didn't have much of so any social media as well. 
So how did people just come in great numbers knowing that there is a visitation of God, a move of God, is basically because people went out and reached out to their own communities, the word just spread, or people just experienced. So even when we were looking at uh, William Brenham or uh, Maria Woodworth, we saw that, you know, um, she was just preaching and teaching uh, in a in a in a small congregation, but the power and the move of God was just moving in that community, in that city, in that locality, right? And many people were just falling to the ground because they were convicted of their sins and they were just accepting God. So they were not necessarily there in that meeting when the meeting was happened, the revival meeting was happened. But that is a revival because the way God moves, He moves, you know, His presence and His power in the community, in the society, in the city, in the locality, and in that nation. So people just can experience okay, the move and the power of God, and they are drawn. Okay, So uh, we see that revive, many revivals had happened. There was no social media. There's no way to interact with people from different cities, but yet people were coming from all over the place. That is what is the meaning of revival. Yeah. Okay. I'm during the 80s and 90s when Billy Graham had this crusade meetings and thing. So can you actually say that, you know, there was revival post that, like many times the ga gatherings were huge and uh, many of them gave their lives. So do we say that uh, revival emerged during those crusade meetings as well? So that is what we, we need to say. There are many crusades that happen, like Billy Graham's evangelistic crusades. Yes, many people were touched, many people were healed, many people were saved. But was that a revival? Did it, you know, did all this happen? In, in, a, in a smaller way, yes, you know, but when we're talking about a revival in sense of the visitation, the move of God, all these things happen. But all of these are also characteristic, can also be characteristic of crusades. But uh, when we say really revival, these are some things that happen. Okay. So um, uh, the fifth one is that we see that, you know, um, <coughs> So we see that you know people came from all over the place and how was this happening it was basically of course news was spreading obviously this news was spreading for through people as people were impacted it was going out but also it was just the presence of god that was drawing people to that place okay so it was just the presence of god saying hey go there the presence of god just drawing people so people could see that there's something happening there they wanted to go they were drawn to that place so you don't have to do anything uh, to publicize it. It was just people, you know, experiencing the move of God, the nudge, the stirring in their hearts, and they just came and pursued God and joined everyone else, you know, and that is another characteristic of revival. The fifth characteristic of revival, or we can say that this is a revival that is happening, is there's a great increase of number of people who will be saved okay a great number of people will come to the faith and we see that on the day of pentecost right how many people came to the faith three thousand were added to the church okay so we see that that is the kind of response that happens you know that shows that happens in a revival people just experience the presence of god they convicted and respond in faith of course in crusades and meetings people son but it will be like say 200, 250, 200, but here there is a, a greater and a larger multiplication and an impact, okay? Any questions so far? All of you with me? Yes, you're not dreaming of revivals? <laughs> okay, the sixth one is more signs, wonders, and miracles. So even as we pursue God, even as we pursue uh, the presence of God and intimacy of God, we say that what is a natural outflow of revival? What is a natural outflow of revival? Science, miracles, and wonders, yes, transformation of lives that, that happens permanently, lifestyles change, people change, and there's greater uh, mission and evangelization that happens, okay? So we also see a powerful transformation in society that happens, okay? And we see what God wants to do. So we, we see that God uh, breaks down walls or barriers or, uh, you know, breaks down strongholds and bondages. 
or you know we see what god wants to do in terms of you know healing or god wanting to restore people or restoring the church or restoring the you know uh, the uh, uh, the believers whatever it is that god wants to do all of that will happen and we see that happening miraculously okay nobody will be standing in front and you know just giving an altar call and all people will just receive healing people will just be cut in their hearts people will, lives will be restored they'll be convicted of their sins and they will just you know give up their own uh, wicked evil um, way so we see that all of these things will happen as a result of god, what god wants to do it's not what we desire it's not what we want to do but it's what god wants to do what god wants to desire or what he wants to uh, bring forth what he wants to restore or what he wants to reinstate in that city in that locality or in that nation and also in the nations of the world so we see a powerful transformation of society and this is what we talk as the move of god okay so i'll just read a small expert sorry i'll just read a small excerpt from um, you know from the welish revival that happened okay uh, there are multiple stories like this from different revivals you know where bars were closed down you know pubs were closed down because people did not want to go and drink anymore um, and even in places where a lot of alcohol was consumed those things of uh, those kind of things just stopped immediately because there was a revival happening in that city or the town or in that area okay so i'm just going to read a small excerpt from the welish revival it says all over the country testimonies of hardened souls receiving salvation and lives being changed by the talk of the town the impact of the lord's hand was noticed evidently in the lives of people stories of profanity you know what is profanity what is profanity Yes, foul, vulgar language that was spoken was silence. That means people who were just speaking foul uh, language, uh, you know, bad words and all of those things was, everything came to a silence. Nobody was speaking, uh, uh, you know, evil, bad things or wicked things or, uh, you know, bad things. You know, so the stories of profanity were silence. Tear, 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 tears were deserted. Courts abandoned due to a lack of crime and bars uh, were shutting down. Uh, um, and all of this was very, very common. Okay. So no one was going to theaters. You know, uh, they lost their business. Courts were abandoned because there was no crime. Okay. So no lawsuits that was filed. No, uh, uh, you know, hearings that were there in the courts. And also that bars were shutting down why because there was nobody drinking there was such a change in the society there was such a change in the lives of um, people okay and they say that entertainment such as football matches you know simply could not compete with the presence of the glorious visitation of god you know in european countries people love football they're crazy it's like a god for them right they go crazy and mad for football Okay, so she says that even entertainment such as football, or we can talk about our country, cricket, you know, people are so mad at the cricket, you know, uh, people just could not compete with the presence of the glorious visitation of God. Okay, and the sales of beer and alcohol uh, declined steeply while pocket testaments, you know, testament, New Testament Bibles, the pocket testaments, where you know it's just sold like hot cross buns you know uh, it's just a saying like you know it went like hot buns or hot you know it went just went so fast people were just buying it like anything and uh, because people were just so hungry for the bread of life they were just so hungry for the word of god and they were so hungry for not alcohol or smoking or you know uh, doing drugs but they were just hungry for the true living water so this is what happens when there is a revival so if in billy graham's crusades if all of this happens then we can call that as a revival okay where the society and the uh, the city and the nation itself is transformed so this happened during the Welsh uh, revival and we will see more like this in other revivals as 
well. Now, a story is told about uh, how the horses in the mines, you know, the, you know, horses, right? In the mines, you know, mines, gold my, uh, fields or the other mines, um, the horses were co so confused because the men who, you know, were driving these horses, you know, they stopped using bad words. They stopped using obscenity. Okay. There were no using, no more using bad, filthy words. And they were no longer kicking the animal and beating it up to move fast. So the horses, they were saying, was also confused at the change or the behavior of the people who were driving them. That was such a great transformation of lives. Okay. The seventh one is we see that there's more equipping of people um, for missions. Um, okay. So we see that, you know, when revival happens, people are equipped, they're sent forth uh, into the mission fields many of them go they give up their jobs they want to just uh, that they're sold out to just uh, preach and teach the word of god and this can happen in the same country the same city or also across across um, uh, nations where this revival fire can be carried okay so that is what we see when revival happens okay any questions what well, any questions anyone has there, online students yeah there, there could also be a possible uh, see i'm i was not aware of this welsh revival that you just mentioned that happened in 2023 we look at the welsh revival we study yes. about the welsh uh, revival so i mean what i mean is like i was not aware of this okay okay so there is a possibility that there is a revival happening some part of rural india africa or any other places that we could also not be aware of no no, that uh, is it that saying, you know there there's is a, a revival that the whole world will know, or is it something that you know we may not be kind of aware that's happening in some part of the world? It may not be to a bigger revival, but also a small revival, a medium sized type of a revival. Is there a feasibility? No, that is what we're saying. When revival happens, it's even if it's in rural uh, Bangalore, the city will know, Karnataka will know, uh, India will know, it will also spread towards the, uh, to the other nations as well. Yes. Maybe that the, is a characteristic of revival. Rather than just a crusade or something that a move of God that is happening in a three day meeting or a four day meeting. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, is there a time limitation for how long it can go? One day, two day, one week? A time, a time limit? That all depends on God. Uh, yes, it depends on God and also people pursuing, I think, the revival. But uh, what happens as a, as, a, as a result of the revival that's happened there, it's like a wildfire. The forest fire, when it catches, it just spreads across the whole forest. So that revival fire that started there, maybe the revival happens in APC, it starts here, it moves to other churches in Bangalore City, it will move to Karnataka, move to India and to the nations of the world. So people will take it to um, the other parts of the world, just like on the day of Pentecost. We will study about what happened on the day of Pentecost, yes. So Daniel say, asked, does government raise objection when revival comes? Yes, there will be a lot of objection. How do we know that there will be objection and persecution when revival breaks out? How do we know? What is the prototype? What, are we, what is the main revival move that we are studying and looking at all other revivals in the light of that? Which one? From Acts, Acts chapter no. 1. Yes. Sorry, Warren. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. Yes. Yes, during, Warren. During, yeah, during the Pentecost as well, there was a lot of opposition to what happened to the, the apostles. Yes, on the day of Pentecost, uh, we see that there, there was that was a revival, right? So you need to keep this in your mind, okay? Every, all that we are going to be studying, we're going to be seeing all revivals in the light of which revival? The Pentecost, okay? The revival that happened on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, okay? So we're going to see all of that in the light of what happened uh, in Acts chapter uh, 2, okay? And uh, was there a persecution that broke out after the revival? Yes, there was a major persecution. But what was the end result of that? Even though persecution broke out, what was the result, end result of that? Yes, the what? church grew and, yes, Lucy? 
church grew and the gospel spread it uh, spread to uh, spread to many people yes the church son and the gospel spread to many surrounding areas and nations as well okay so yes government can raise objections when revival comes uh, lucy's question is how do we get such revivals happening in our nation how do we get revivals in our nation fasting and prayer is fasting and prayer enough for revival to be birth what should we do hello we said that in the beginning of this class we said that the whole of last week when we were studying two hours to birth revival what is important what should we pursue yes uh, we need to uh, an intimacy with god greater intimacy with god okay so when we pursue intimacy with god obviously comes a uh, prayer and intercession and worship and just soaking in the presence of god just reading his word but a uh, revival happens as a result of people who are pursuing god for the you know greater intimacy with god and that's when he comes and he visits and he moves yes um uh, get to to get to this when people turn to god is uh, happens as a result of revival and also happens uh, without that as well yes when people are turning to god but majorly when people are pursuing a greater intimacy with god yes sam daniel you had your hand up you had a question yeah i uh, just wanted to um re uh, sorry just confirm or reiterate the point that when a revival happens um it has to spread to other regions as well or like you know for example if a church um is you know having a heightened manifestation of god and there's you know that community is like really uh, pursuing god uh wouldn't we call that a revival or it needs to spread um you know they just wanted to kind of like like the definition of revival um does it mean that it needs to spread and impact the larger community uh yeah that was just my question yes so there are uh, you know we can call many things as revival okay when suddenly we have uh, pursuing god into a greater intimacy with god we are revived in our spirit we revive in our vision and our passion that's experiencing personal a uh, revival okay uh, when something is basically when something is dead is coming back to life in a church also can experience a revival in the sense that there is you know a greater passion and hunger and the thirsting for god and um, you know we are seeing a greater manifestation of the holy spirit but we are saying that when revival happens when the, there's a great move of god we're saying that it is exponentially greater than what we really experience in our uh, you know sunday services or in our own personal experiences it's a greater exponential growth in greater terms that's why we're saying that uh, you know Uh, yes during a revival that you, we, what you are saying as an ex calling as an example for revival in a church yes there can be people like you know 100 people are saved uh, after a certain period of time or 150 people are say people are excited about it two or three of them or uh, you know couple of them also go out for mission work evangelization all that is fine you know uh, we can call that as uh, in a revival in a smaller sense but what we're saying revival is and the visitation and a move of god is when all of these happening happens and there's exponential growth in every way exponential growth like in the day of pentecost like 3000 of them you know were added and then um, <clears throat> Acts chapter four, when Paul is, uh, you know, the lame man is healed, and Paul preaches, four thousand were added to the number, and then you know people uh, uh, had come all over from Jeru, uh, from all over the nations to Jerusalem. They were impacted. They were learning from the apostles. Um, there was unity. There was prayer. There was worship. They were just taught of the doctrines, and what happened was they took the gospel back to wherever they came from. So we know that Paul writing to the church at Rome or the the church at colosse you know uh, paul did not start the church at rome or he did not start the church at colosse but uh, how do we 
uh, so what do how, how can we say the church in rome was started so many scholars say it's because some of them who had come uh, during that you know 60 day period to celebrate the three feasts uh, at jerusalem you know they experienced what happened uh, on the day of pentecost and they took they were taught by the apostles because you know they spent 60 days there in jerusalem they go back to rome and they take the gospel and churches were established there and also elsewhere in other uh, regions surrounding Jerusalem and in the nations, Asia Minor, Europe. So that is what we are saying as revival. And when we're talking about revival and visitation and move of God, we're saying all of these seven things that we mentioned happens in a greater magnitude than what we just experience in a crusade meeting or in a church that is being revived or, uh, you know, a person that is re being revived, it's just an exponential growth and transformation of city that happens. So what you're saying is uh, you can call that revival in a church, but only the church people are experiencing. Of course, they're going and sharing the gospel with their um, friends in the workplace, the neighborhood. But what we're saying when revival happens is there's such a move of God that even if people don't go and, um, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 advertise about it. The, the the power of God just moves and touches people and people are drawn to that um, place. And um, uh, what happens in, in terms of transforming lives in society is so much more greater than uh, what happens in uh, what you were giving as an example in the church. So in the church, yes, many of them, you know, they might, uh, you know, uh, profanity might be silenced. Uh, people would um, not be drinking or, you know, those who are hooked to pornography, everything will stop. Lifestyles will change. Happens in the church. But here we're talking about transformation that happens in the society, in the city, to such a larger ex extent that the government, the officers, the police, would all come to know about what is happening. And that is what we are really saying is the revival visitation and the move of God. So did that help? Yeah, yeah, got it. Got it. Thank you. OK. OK, any other questions? Ma'am? Yes. Like there is revival when God works and moves and there is visitation. No? So is there any possibility of like Satan also can work like that? And what we can call that? Is there a possibility that Satan can work like that? Yeah, in that speed, in that movement. What is your answer to... Uh, did all of you in the online students get Nelson's question? He's saying when um, revival, visitation and the moves of... Is your mic on? Okay. Uh, Nelson's question was when revivals, visitation and moves of God happens, we see such a great larger impact and magnitude and exponential uh, growth in, in, in every area, okay? So can Satan also do that in such a great magnitude? What is your response to Nelson's question? Can you pass Sanjay the mic, please? Are all uh, online students able to hear what our in-person students are speaking? Okay, thank you, Abhishek. Thank you. Yes, uh, Satan is already doing it. If, if, if you look at the, the 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 movie industry or the music industry, he's already you know using uh, those forms of media to draw people. If you look at the big concerts that they, they have, musicians have concerts, and the way uh, movies are drawing people to the theaters. In a way, Satan is already operating to draw people away from God through various forms of media. And if you look at sports also, sports, I'm not against sports, but sports is also a way of, you know, uh, trying to capture the minds of people and, uh, you know, uh, try to keep them away from God. So Satan is already at work in the various, uh, uh, I would say, spheres. Mountains of spheres. Spheres, okay. spheres, spheres of influence. influence He's already okay. at work. So he, he doesn't uh, rest, you can say. Okay, thank you, Sanjay. Anyone else? Any thoughts on that? Online students? I um, agreed uh, to Nelson's uh, you know question, but uh, to an extent he's active, like prowling like a tiger, but uh, not to the extent of a revival and the outflow of it. Okay, not to the extent of a revival and the outpouring, okay? 
when the power of God is moving in a powerful way and working, how can the enemy be at a place? Okay, that's what Lucy says. Andrew says, no, if you see Philip and Simon the sorcerer, he could not do greater things. Yeah, Andrew. That was so powerful, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Good. Yeah, so we see, uh, if you look at the Old Testament, even if you look at the New Testament, uh, let's look, for example, at Moses. Now, Moses goes very excited to go. He has his staff in his hand, and he knows God is going to do all these mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. And so he goes, and he puts down his staff, and uh, it turns into a snake. And uh, what does Pharaoh do? Is he, is he like, wow, who is this man? Where did this power come from? Is he astonished and amazed? No, he just laughs at him in a mocking way, so to say. It's not given the Bible, I'm just reading through, uh, looking into it. And then what does he do? He just claps his hand and tells, okay, show Moses. So his magicians come and they throw their sticks or their stuff. And what happens? Become snake, okay? And so Moses must have thought, oh God, what are you doing here? Am I going to be a loser like, you know? So, but what does, uh, what does Moses' snake do? Yeah, it swallows up all the other snakes. Now, does God tell Moses, when God uh, tells Moses, go and strike the uh, Nile, okay? And what does, it, what does it turn into? Blood. So, uh, is uh, Pharaoh alarmed? No. He tells his magicians and his magicians do the same thing, right? And frogs, they're also able to bring out the frogs, but they're not able to get out the frogs and then after that all of those plagues we see that you know um, uh, they say hey this is a finger of God we can't play against God that's what the magician says so to an extent they were able to do beyond that they were not able to do but did God say oh oh you know they're also doing the same uh, miracles uh, Moses let's think of something else let's think of something else that God tell Moses that no he tells Moses to keep going on with one plague after the other, to after the other, to after the other, and comes to a point where these magicians are not able to function anymore. Even if you look at the Old Testament, there were many prophets, false prophets, so to say, they were prophesying. Okay, if you look at, um, like Andrew mentioned, you know, um, when Philip went down to Samaria, Acts chapter 8, we see that there was a sorcerer there, right? And he was also doing great, uh, uh, mighty works. And we see that even when Paul goes to the city of Ephesus, that this, this girl who was with an evil spirit, she was, you know, foretelling and all that she was foretelling was coming true. And she was great, earning great money for, the, uh, for her master. But when Paul rebukes that spirit, the spirit comes out. The master and people were very, very angry. There was a great uproar. Okay. But we see that even in the city of Ephesus, when they saw Paul doing mighty signs, miracles and wonders, what did all of these sorcerers do? They went and sold, they went and burned all of the scrolls that was so, so expensive. And they all came to the saving knowledge of God. Okay. Even in the city of Samaria, we see Simon the sorcerer. He wanted the, when, uh, when um, um, Peter and John, the disciples go there to baptize the people in the Holy Spirit, what happens? You know, he also wants to buy that gift to money. And so Paul, uh, Peter uh, rebukes him, right? And so we see even Simon the sorcerer was changed. So yes, uh, the enemy can do certain things to a certain extent, but, you know, the power of God is greater. But one truth you need to always keep in mind before we end this class is that on the cross, what did, what, what did Jesus do? Huh? It is finished. What did Jesus do on the cross? Disarmed the enemy. He, yes, he disarmed every principality power of the enemy. That means your enemy and I, my enemy, Satan, is disarmed of all his powers. He's nullified. He is nullified of all his powers. And actually, he's paralyzed. Can a paralyzed person do anything? No. So all that we are anticipating and giving to him is not rightful ownership and, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the thing that is due to, but we need to see our enemy as somebody who is nullified and whose power is no more operative and is rendered 
uh, nullified, okay, and he's paralyzed. So yes, he can do things to a certain extent, but God's uh, is greater and his power is much more greater than the enemy. Okay, thank you. We'll continue after um, the break. See you all after the break.